<laughs> when the witching hour draws near, she will whisper in your ear, nightmares do come true. This is a horror fiction podcast featuring stories that will shock, disturb, and dismay. You're listening to the Dark Lady Podcast. Tonight we visit the home of Mrs. Bernadine, an old widow who lives in the suburbs of Sunnyside, California. After the recent passing of her husband, George, Mrs. Bernadine locked herself away in her quiet stone house on Fairview Road. Alone and mad with grief, she unknowingly awakens an ancient evil hidden inside the walls of her home. It was three in the afternoon. The sun was glaring down my eyes, forcing me into a rude awakening. It was the fourth day in a row that I had fallen asleep on the sofa. My mind was in a fog, and my body was numb. Still, I forced myself to sit up. White pills were scattered on the floor, like snow. I must have knocked down my mats on the floor the other night. A tall, green wine bottle sat on the coffee table, taunting me. I grabbed it by the neck and tried to take another drink. It was empty, like me. I staggered towards the fireplace and swiped a carton of cigarettes from the mantel. Next to my cigarettes was a framed photograph of me and my late husband, George. We were young. I was 22, and he was 24. It was a beautiful summer day. I was wearing my mother's wedding dress with short, puffy sleeves. George wore his best tuxedo. He was tall, with broad shoulders, and dark hair, and blue eyes. I traced our smiles with my finger. We looked so happy. It had been a month since my George died. It was a lovely marriage. We had been together for about thirty years. We lived in a big, two-story house in Sunnyside, California. It was a grand old house, with stone walls and cherry wood floors. There was enough room for two families, maybe three. It had been in the Bernadine family for generations. Smoke escaped from my lips and hovered above the fireplace like a ghost. There were red poppies painted on the walls. Every room in the Bernadine house was decorated with custom, hand-painted wallpaper. Even the closets and the cupboards. There were daisies in the main bedroom, tulips in the guest rooms, wild roses in the study. I used to think that the walls made our house so fresh and so green that it was always springtime. But when George died... All the joy and wonderment that I had once felt about the paintings had disappeared. Now, the poppies look like blood, splattered on the living room walls. Still, I could not bring myself to get rid of the wallpaper. George was very particular about the walls. He would not let me hang any pictures or posters or anything else that might damage the wallpaper. For as long as we were married... He would always tell me, 
whatever you do, don't scratch the walls. Don't scratch the walls. The phone rang. Hello? It was my niece, Grace. She lived upstate in San Francisco. It was about a seven-hour drive away from Sunnyside. She was a lovely young woman with a sweet disposition. George and I always wanted a child like her. I'm worried about you, Auntie. Why don't you stay with me and Ken for a while? Sweetheart, I'm fine. Besides, your uncle would have hated it if someone wasn't around to look after the house. I know. You've been through a lot lately. I just don't want you to be alone. Oh, never mind that. You take care of your babies. I can take care of myself. I, I know you can, but... Grace... There's something that I've been meaning to talk to you about. What is it? Well, I'm in the middle of writing my will. Now, I thought long and hard about this. Even though your uncle and I never had children, I still think that he would have wanted our house to stay with family. I want you to have the house after I'm gone. Auntie, I don't know what to say. Just tell me that you'll take care of the house, and one day you'll pass it down to your children. Yes. Of course I will. We talked a few more moments before saying goodbye. Grace told me that her youngest child, Harvey, would turn three years old next week. She had invited me to his birthday party. It was nice to have something to look forward to. I needed to clean myself up before then. I went about my day. I cleaned the house, I washed the dishes, mopped the floors, and cut some coupons from the newspaper. Before I knew it, it was nighttime again. I put some leftover steak and mashed potatoes in the microwave and set the timer for exactly two minutes. I sat on the kitchen table and tried not to look at the third cabinet from the right and set the timer for exactly two minutes. I sat there patiently and waited for the timer to run out. The lemons on the wallpaper seemed to stare at me like big, dull eyes. I only needed to wait two minutes, then dinner would be ready. Then I could go to bed early and try to catch up on my sleep. The microwave beeped, letting me know the food was ready. That sound... It was such a simple and innocent sound, but somehow it reached all the way to the back of my mind and brought forth a terrible memory. I closed my eyes and found myself in St. Mercy's Hospital again, in room 301. I held George's hand as he took his last breaths. He was in the most wretched way. His hair was gone, and he was so thin and frail. George? I said softly. George? Honey? Can you hear me? George turned his head weakly and looked at me one last time. His eyes were dull and half open. He didn't have the strength to speak. I smiled at him reassuringly and patted the top of his hand. Everything is going to be fine, I said. Everything has been taken care of. The house... the house is... George? My husband's face suddenly twisted into a horrified expression. I had never seen George like this before. His eyes went wide and his mouth contorted as if he was trying to scream. He looked at me as if I were the devil himself coming to drag him to hell. 
He gripped my hand tight and squeezed it so hard that I thought he would break it. George? Honey, what's wrong? You're hurting me, sweetheart. Please, let go. George? George! I didn't want that to be the last memory I had of my husband, but it was. I got up, walked to the third cabinet on the right, and pulled out a new bottle of wine. The bottle was sealed tight, and I needed a corkscrew to open it. I opened every door and every cabinet in the kitchen, but I couldn't find the damn bottle opener. In my anger, I accidentally pulled on one of the doors too roughly, and the silver knob came right off. I needed to fix it. I went into the hallway and made my way toward the white door that led into the basement. I knew that George kept his toolbox down there. When I opened the door, I saw an old, decrepit staircase leading into a black void. It was too dark to see the rest. I pulled on the black cord dangling from the ceiling, but the light bulb had burnt out. I returned with a flashlight and slowly descended into the darkness. I had lived in this house for thirty years, but I had only been inside the basement once or twice. I never had much interest in being in such a dark and dreary place. Whenever George was in a foul mood, he would hide down here. Sometimes he would stay in the basement for days. When he came back upstairs, I would sometimes smell whiskey on his breath. I never liked it when he came down here, but at least I always knew where he was. I quickly found a lamp in the corner of the room and turned it on. It illuminated the basement with a dull yellow glow. Unlike the rest of the house, there were no windows, and the walls were bare. There was only concrete and gray stone. The basement was littered with cardboard boxes, stacks of old newspapers, and gardening tools. The shelves were coated with dust and cobwebs. I found a red toolbox sitting on George's work table. When I reached out to pick it up, I noticed something strange in the corner of my eye. There was a chair facing the wall. As I came closer, I realized that there was a small door mounted on the wall. It was about three feet long, two feet wide, and twelve inches thick. The contraption was made of wood, and it looked like a cabinet that had been painted black. Even the doorknob was painted black. I pushed the chair aside softly and knocked on the mysterious door. When I ran my hand across the wood, I found etchings at the bottom of the door. It was not English or any other kind of language known to man. However, the scratches looked deliberate. Perhaps they were runes or sigils or some kind of alien communication. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. I pulled and I pulled, but the cabinet did not budge. I thought about using a sledgehammer, but quickly reconsidered. There may have been precious heirlooms or important documents hidden inside. I didn't want to risk damaging anything. As I raked through the shelves, I accidentally knocked a rusty tin can onto the floor. I picked it up and found a small golden key taped at the bottom. I took the key to the black cabinet and pushed it through the keyhole. It was a perfect fit. I slowly opened the door. It was empty. The only thing inside the cabinet was plain white wallpaper with a great blue iris painted in the middle. There was a small black scar in the middle of the flower. Was it mold? I poked the blemish with my finger. Strange, it didn't feel like paper. It felt like a scar that had scabbed over. 
I tried scratching at it, wondering if it would come off. Suddenly, the scar cracked and split open, revealing a green eye. It was a human eye, with no eyelashes, no eyebrow, and no face. It stared at me, silently, intently. At first, I didn't understand what I was seeing. I thought I was imagining things. Perhaps it was the grief or the wine. But when that disembodied eye blinked at me, I knew that it was alive. I slammed the cabinet door shut and ran up the stairs, screaming. My thoughts were racing. Was there a dead body in the walls? But it was alive, wasn't it? George, what have you done? I grabbed my car keys, ran towards the front door, and laid my hand on the doorknob. Before I ran out into the neighborhood, screaming, something made me hesitate. No, stop, I said, laughing at myself, trying to regain my sanity. This is crazy. I'm being silly. I convinced myself that it didn't happen. It couldn't have happened. It was a spider or a roach. Maybe it was the poor lighting in the basement, or some kind of trick in the eye. I must have not seen it correctly. I was tired, and I needed to take better care of myself. That was all. I threw my car keys back on the coffee table and marched myself upstairs into my bedroom. I climbed into bed, pulled the covers over my head, and told myself that things would get better in the morning. I closed my eyes and drifted off to sleep. Eventually, morning came. I woke up and extended my arm across the empty space on the bed. The sun spilled into the room, illuminating the white and yellow wallpaper. I sighed, rolled over to my back, and looked up at the ceiling. To my horror, the green, disembodied eye was staring down at me from the ceiling. Its pupil twitched from side to side as I screamed and struggled to pull myself out of bed. The white sheets tangled around my legs, making me trip and fall as I ran towards the door. I stumbled down the stairs and into the kitchen. I should have ran outside the house and called for help. But I could not ignore the anger and disgust that was gnawing at the pit of my stomach. I had never felt so violated. How dare this thing enter my bedroom and take away everything I had left. I grabbed a butcher knife from the door and slowly made my way back upstairs. My hands trembled as I pushed open the bedroom door and pointed my knife at the ceiling. The evil eye was gone. I scanned every corner of the room, but nothing moved. Nothing seemed out of place. Where are you? I demanded. Come out! I spun around, the white and yellow wallpaper whirling around me. Was I losing my mind? My fear and anger quickly turned into shame. If Grace saw me this way, she would never let me see my grandnephew again. I dropped my knife. It clattered on the floor as I wept. 
my God, what's the matter with me? I cried. I fell silent when the door suddenly closed by itself. I looked up from my hands and saw the green eye embedded on the wallpaper beside the door. It stared at me coldly, its pupil dilated. The wall suddenly pulsed and throbbed, causing me to fall onto my knees. The eye's long, fixed stare was hypnotic. I was unable to scream, unable to move. My legs felt heavy, as if they were pinned under a boulder. My eyes burned. I couldn't close them. It felt like two invisible hands were prying my eyelids open, forcing me to stare back at the creature living in my wall. I couldn't blink or break away from its malevolent gaze. The evil eye called to me. It wanted me to come closer. It wanted to be looked upon and worshipped. Then my body moved on its own, like a puppet being pulled by its strings. I crawled forward until my face was only inches away from the disembodied eye. I whimpered as the creature slowly looked at my left eye and then my right. It spoke to me not with words, but projected its thoughts directly into my brain. It wanted to know where the other one was. The other one? What other one? I forced myself to speak. Do you mean George? The eye twitched up and down in response. He's dead, I whispered. Pathetic, it said. How pathetic. What are you? Yes. What am I? It was mocking me. What the hell do you want from me? The evil eye looked amused. Pathetic. How pathetic. It said. Pathetic. How pathetic. I suppose you'll have to do. Suddenly, a car passed by my house, sending a flash of light through the window. The reflection bounced off my vanity mirror and flashed into my eyes, temporarily blinding me. I blinked and broke free from the malevolent gaze. I fell backwards and grabbed the butcher knife from the floor. I lunged at the eye desperately and stabbed at the wall. At the last second, the eye moved about two inches to the left, narrowly escaping the blow. I pulled the knife out of the wall and stabbed it again. The eye moved downwards this time. It blinked at me, slowly. It looked amused. If it had a mouth, I'm sure it would have laughed at me. I stabbed at the eye again. This time, I dragged the knife across the wallpaper in a zigzag pattern. The eye couldn't move away fast enough. Squish. I cut the eye in half. Blood and pus oozed out of the wall. The eye rolled back in agony. It withered and died in a matter of seconds, leaving a black scar on the wall. (laughs) There! I killed it! It was like squishing a bug! My victory quickly turned into ashes in my mouth. The wallpaper began to crack and bubble all around me. Boils the size of golf balls appeared on the walls. One of the boils burst open, revealing another evil eye, the same shape and color as the first one. It glared at me, angrily. 
before it had the chance to bring my body back into submission, I pushed the blade through its pupil. Warm, red blood trickled from the knife down to my wrist. The room was spinning. Dozens and dozens of green, twitching eyes appeared on all four walls. They stared at me, judging me, mocking me, taunting me. A thousand voices suddenly rattled in my head. The voices spoke in unison. Pathetic. 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 I screamed madly. Something inside me broke, and I lost all of my senses. I slashed and stabbed at the wall from left to right. It seemed that for every evil eye I killed, three more appeared to take its place. I must have cut a thousand eyes on the wall before my knife snapped in half. They couldn't all be killed. I dropped the broken knife and ran down the hall, screaming. I fled down the stairs and tried to open the front door. The door would not budge, no matter how hard I pulled. I tried to open the windows, but they were sealed shut. I was trapped inside my own home. I whirled around and looked up at the staircase. The cherry blossom wallpaper was beginning to bubble and boil. Whatever this thing was, it was spreading through the house like an infection. I ran into the kitchen and snatched the phone off the wall. There was no dial tone. The line was dead. I was about to completely lose my mind when a sweet and familiar sound creeped into my ear. I put the receiver back into its cradle and found another butcher's knife from the kitchen drawer. I slowly walked through the hall and into the living room. The music was coming from upstairs. The walls in the hallway began to rot and turn black. Big, green, bulging eyes the size of my fist had appeared on the wallpaper. I was careful not to look at the eyes directly, not wanting to be hypnotized again. They throbbed and twitched excitedly as I made my way towards George's old study room. There was a faint white light shining beneath the door. Someone was inside. I pointed the knife at the man sitting at the desk in the corner of the room. The man sat there, motionless, his back turned against me. He wore a black tuxedo, had thick, dark hair and broad shoulders. Who are you? I demanded. The man did not answer me. Get out of my house. Do you hear me? Get out of my house. The man stood up from the chair and turned around, revealing his face. It was George. He looked as young and as beautiful as he did on our wedding day. I took a step backwards, still holding the knife out in front of me, defensively. I don't understand. You died a month ago. How is this possible? Come here, Anita. Let me hold you. George smiled at me. Somehow, his expression seemed distant and hollow. I made the mistake of gazing into the man's eyes. My George's eyes were bright blue. But now, his eyes were glowing green. His gaze drew me in. Before I knew it, he was holding me in his arms. This is your favorite song, isn't it? I nodded at him. My body felt numb. George put his hand on my hip. I refused to let go of my knife 
so George held my wrist instead. We started to dance a slow waltz. We haven't danced in years. We were getting too old for it. George spun me around and around and around. Everything was a blur. All I could see was George's face and the sweet roses painted on the walls behind him. The red, pink, and white roses seemed to sway back and forth with the music. It was like a dream. It doesn't have to end. George whispered in my ear. You and me, we can be young again. How? By doing what we have always done. We take care of this house, and the house will take care of us. What are you saying to me? I looked over his shoulder and saw that the door was beginning to rot and turn black. The disease was starting to seep through the walls. They're coming. George, please, we need to leave. I pulled away from George and felt something wet and warm underneath my toes. I looked down and found myself standing on a massive, disembodied eye that was about the size of my bathtub. The giant eye twitched, causing me to slip and fall backwards. I hit the back of my head against a bookcase. When I looked up, I found myself surrounded. There were disembodied eyes everywhere, thousands of them, much bigger than before. They appeared on the ceiling, on the walls, and on the furniture. George, help me. It's all right, Anita. Everything will be all right. The man smiled at me, insincerely. His eyes were cold. He had George's face and hair and clothes, but I knew that the man standing before me now was hollow, a mannequin, a body without a soul. You are not my husband. Oh God, what do you want from me? Why won't you leave me alone? The walls pulsed and throbbed like a heartbeat. The eyes spoke to me, projecting their desires directly into my thoughts. More. More. Bring us more. Feed. Feed. Let us feed. Feed. Feed on what? Before I could respond, the thing pretending to be my husband slowly approached me. Somehow, without looking down, he managed not to step on any of the eyes protruding from the floor. Get away! Don't touch me! I brandished my weapon, trying to stab at the mannequin, but one look into the man's eyes, and my arm went numb. I dropped the knife, and he lifted me to my feet. We started to dance again. I tried to make myself stop, but I had no control over my body. The malevolent eyes watched us intently as we danced around the room. We should have a party. You love parties. You can invite all our friends and family. Then we can all be happy again. I shook my head at him. My eyes were burning. I couldn't blink. I couldn't break free from his gaze. I thought I would go blind. What kind of evil is this? Evil. We're not evil. Your small human mind is just incapable of fully comprehending the great and powerful being that stands before you. Be glad, Anita. You are chosen. No. We are your god. Accept us. No. Open your eyes. Look at us. No! I spat in his face. The voices in my head fell silent. The room stopped moving. The mannequin stared at me blankly. I used all my strength to try to pull away, but the man kept a firm grip on my waist. No matter how much I tried, he would not let me go. 
The evil eyes glared at me as I struggled. I had offended them. A river of blood gushed down the mannequin's head as his face slowly ripped open and split in two. His skull cracked open, revealing a giant green eyeball underneath. The door creaked open, and the mannequin pushed me through the door. We continued our unholy waltz through the hallway. The drywall and the wallpaper had completely rotted away, leaving the foundation bare. Glowing green eyes blinked all around us. The mannequin's movements were fast and unpredictable. He tossed me around and around and around like a rag doll. Please, let me go. Of course, dear. Oh! He whirled me around one last time before throwing me down the staircase. I tumbled down the steps and cracked my head against the cherry wood floor. The world turned black. My eyes were heavy, but I forced them open. It felt like I had been asleep for days. The last thing I remembered was dancing with George in the study room. Was it all just a bad dream? I pushed myself off the ground. Pain shot up and down my body. I was stiff and sore all over. But nothing seemed broken. My hand slipped. Knocking a wine bottle to the ground, it rolled underneath the sofa. There were half-empty wine bottles scattered all over the floors and on the tables. Did I do this? How could I drink so much? I began to look up, but quickly averted my gaze onto the floor. The nightmare wasn't over. There were thousands of eyes spread throughout the walls and ceiling, twitching and shifting about excitedly. They were on the doors, on the furniture, and on the windows. The infection had spread throughout the house. There was a loud cracking noise behind me, where the fireplace was. I felt the wall split open. Chunks of wood and drywall rained down onto the floor. I kept my head down as I turned around slowly, careful not to look at the thing protruding above the fireplace. In the corner of my eye, I saw it. The great behemoth. The monster finally revealing its true form. The eye stretched about ten feet long above the fireplace. It was big enough to swallow me whole. The iris began to glow green, beckoning me to lay my eyes upon it. I forced myself to turn back around. I knew that if I looked at it directly, even for a split second, I would die. The phone rang. I closed my eyes and walked forwards, towards the kitchen. I counted my footsteps and tried to remember all the doors and corners by memory. When I felt the cold linoleum on my toes, I knew that I was in the kitchen. Bits of wallpaper crunched under my feet like eggshells. I held out my hands in front of me, trying to find the receiver. The wallpaper was coated with pus and slime. I touched a protrusion that felt as big as my face and the wall recoiled backwards. Finally, I found the phone and snatched it off the wall. Hello? Hi, Auntie. Grace? 
We pulled over to get some gas, but we'll be in Sunnyside in about an hour. I don't understand. Auntie? Don't you remember? You invited us to come down so we could celebrate Harvey's birthday. No, I, I didn't. Of course you did. We talked about it last Sunday. Last Sunday? I had been asleep for six days. I took a step back as the walls suddenly began to throb. Grace, listen to me very carefully. You cannot come to this house. Uh, Auntie, I can't hear you. You're breaking up. Grace. Grace! The line went dead. I could hear the eyes twitching excitedly, hungrily. I tried to dial Grace's number when a cold hand caressed my shoulder. I made the mistake of turning around and opening my eyes. The mannequin stood before me, mocking me with my husband's face. His eyes glowed green, his voice was monotonous and apathetic. Where do you think you're going, Anita? He grabbed me by the hair and dragged me across the kitchen floor. I shielded my face with my hands and screwed my eyes shut. There's so much to do and so little time. Don't you want to bake little Harvey a birthday cake? No. What's the matter? Don't you want to see your family again? One last time before you die. He pried my hands away from my face. His flesh was cold and hard like stone. His fingers pressed against my eyelids, trying to force my eyes open. My hands brushed against the floor desperately. Then I felt a pair of scissors on the ground. I grabbed it and tried to stab the mannequin in the neck. He let go of me for a moment, narrowly avoiding the blow. Before he had a chance to stop me, I pushed the scissors deep inside my eye sockets, blinding myself. As I lay there, screaming in agony and crying tears of blood, I felt the mannequin's weight lift off of my body. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. In my blindness, I found clarity. I felt the evil eyes twitching and glaring at me in every direction. They hissed at me like a thousand angry cockroaches. But they couldn't hurt me anymore. Blood and pus fell from my face and dripped onto the floor as I walked through the hallway. Somehow, I managed to find the strength to reach the front door, but the doorknob would not turn. Whatever I did, this house would not let me go. It wanted to devour me. It wanted to feed on what was left of my soul. Despite it all, my heartbeat was slow and steady. My resolve did not weaken. Let me out, I said. I won't ask again. <laughs> A faint snicker grazed my ear. The door did not budge. The walls were pulsing and throbbing with dark energy. All who entered here would be consumed. I had unleashed a terrible evil into this world, and I knew deep inside my heart that I needed to correct it. I grabbed a bottle of red wine on the coffee table and shook it. It was half full. I walked towards the fireplace and stood before the great behemoth. The wall hummed and vibrated violently. It was an old and intelligent being. I felt its rage and its jealousy. I felt its pride and its scorn. The behemoth pulsed slowly, like a giant heartbeat. I touched my wedding photo one last time. A faint smile spread across my face as I tried to remember how young and happy George and I once were. Don't worry. I'll take care of everything, sweetheart, I said. I promise. I ripped the ends of my nightgown and stuffed the fabric in the wine bottle. 
the great behemoth made a loud, squishing noise as I struck a match and lit the Molotov cocktail on fire. I threw the bottle against the wall above the fireplace, setting the behemoth ablaze. I tossed my head and sighed in relief as I heard the walls scream and wail in agony. It was music to my ears. The flames grew larger and larger by the second, creeping across the floor and ceiling. It purged and purified the evil from this house. The air was heavy with black smoke and intense heat, but I was not afraid. I was at peace with myself. The work was done, and now I could rest. Good night, George, I said. The walls crashed and burned all around me as I lay down on my sofa one last time. Now I could sleep. When Grace and her family arrived in Sunnyside, they found the Bernadine homestead in ashes. It was Anita Bernadine's final gift to her family. They would never know about George's terrible secret. Until next time, my darling, don't forget to keep an eye out for me. This was the Dark Lady Podcast.